Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 3 in the series on Genesis. It's titled Cain and His Legacy, ready for teaching on April 16, and my name's Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the first chapters of the book of Genesis, we learn about your grace and we learn about your forgiveness, but we also learn about the challenges of life. And in many parts of the world at the moment, each of us are experiencing various challenges. And I don't know what challenges each person faces, but today let's pray together and uh, ask that God will bless us, not only as we study the Word, but that as we live our lives, as we share the knowledge of Jesus with those about us, as we work within our families, as we communicate with people around us, and ask that the Holy Spirit will be there to guide and bless each one of us. And as we mine the Word of God, may we find there blessings for each of us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for people in Freetown in Sierra Leone, uh, those who are listening in uh, Sele in Germany, Beirut in Lebanon, Newcastle both in England and Australia, St Lucia in the Caribbean, Montevideo in Uruguay, the Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic Ocean, Kabul in Afghanistan, and Lahore in Pakistan, not to forget those who may be listening in Wuhan in China and Manila in the Philippines. We pray that each of us may gain a better understanding of who our God is and that our relationship with him may be improved this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. In Genesis, what follow immediately after the fall and then the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden are mainly births and deaths, all in fulfilment of God's prophecies in the preceding chapter. As parallel chapters, Genesis 3 and Genesis 4 contain many common themes and words. Descriptions of sin, as you read in Genesis 3, 6 to 8. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And we'll compare that with the following chapter, Genesis 4 and verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. There were curses from the Adama, that's the ground, in Genesis 3 verse 17. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And we compare that with Genesis chapter 4 and verse 11. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand and expulsion genesis 3 and verse 24 so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life and we compare that with genesis 4 verses 12 
When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And verse 16, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. The reason for these parallels is to highlight the fulfilment of what went on before, the prophecies and the predictions that God had given to Adam and Eve after the fall. The first event after Adam's expulsion is full of hope. It is the birth of the first son, an event that Eve sees as the fulfilment of the promise that she heard in the messianic prophecy of Genesis 3.15, which once again we'll read, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That is, she thought he could be the promised Messiah. The next events, the crime of Cain, the crime of Lamech, the decreasing lifespan and the increasing wickedness are all fulfilments of the curse uttered in Genesis chapter 3. Yet, even then, all hope is not lost. Sunday, April 10, Cain and Abel. Read Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What do we learn from these passages about the births of the two males? Genesis 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground. The first event recorded by the biblical author immediately after Adam's expulsion from the Garden of Eden is a birth. In the Hebrew phrase in Genesis 4 verse 1, the words the Lord are directly linked to the words a man, as the following literal translation indicates. I have acquired a man, indeed, the Lord himself. It is rendered by the International Standard Version as, I have given birth to a male child, the Lord. This literal translation suggests that Eve remembers the messianic prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and believes that she has given birth to her Saviour, the Lord. In Desire of Ages, page 31, we read, The Saviour's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfilment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the Redeemer. End of quote. In fact, Cain occupies most of the story. He not only is the firstborn, a son that the parents almost worshipped, But in the chapter, he also is the only brother who, in the Genesis text, speaks. While Eve excitedly comments on Cain's birth, she says nothing at Abel's, at least nothing that is recorded in the text, in contrast to the birth of Cain. The narrator simply reports that she bore again in verse 2 of Genesis 4. The name Cain itself is derived from the Hebrew verb Kana, Q-A-N-A-H, which means to acquire, and denotes the acquisition, the possession of something precious and powerful. On the other hand, the Hebrew name Hebel, H-E-B-E-L, in English Abel, means vapour, a breath. Psalm 62 verse 9 reads, Surely men of low degree are a vapour, men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapour. And Psalm 144 verse 4, Man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. And so this word Hebel denotes elusiveness, emptiness, lack of substance. The same word Hebel, Abel, is used repeatedly in Ecclesiastes for vanity. 
Though we don't want to read more into these short texts than is there, perhaps the idea is that Adam and Eve's hope rested, they believed, only in Cain, because they believed he, not his brother, was the promised Messiah. And so to finish the day, what are things in life that truly are hebel, but that we treat as if they mattered much more than they do? Why is it important to know the difference between what matters and what doesn't? Monday, April 11, The Two Offerings The contrast between Cain and Abel, as reflected in their names, did not just concern their personalities. It also was manifested in their respective occupations. While Cain was a tiller of the ground, Genesis 4 verse 2, a profession requiring physical hard work, Abel was a keeper of sheep in the same verse, a profession implying sensitivity and compassion. Cain was the producer of the fruit of the ground, Abel the keeper of the sheep. These two occupations not only explain the nature of the two offerings, fruit of the ground from Cain and a sheep from Abel, but they also account for the two different psychological attitudes and mentalities associated with the two offerings. Cain was working to acquire the fruit he would produce, while Abel was careful to keep the sheep he had received. Read Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 to 5 and Hebrews 11 verse 4. Why did God accept Abel's offering and reject Cain's offering? How are we to understand what happened here? Genesis 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And Hebrews 11 verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. Without the shedding of blood, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 71, there could be no remission of sin, and they, Cain and Abel, were to show their faith in the blood of Christ as the promised atonement by offering the firstlings of the flock in sacrifice. Besides this, the firstfruits of the earth were to be presented before the Lord as a thank offering. End of quote. While Abel complied with God's instructions and offered the vegetable offering in addition to the animal burnt offering, Cain neglected to do so. He didn't bring an animal to be sacrificed, but only an offering of the fruit of the ground. It was an act of open disobedience, in contrast to the attitude of his brother. Often, this story has been viewed as a classic case of salvation by faith, Abel and his blood offering, in contrast to an attempt to earn salvation by works, Cain and his fruit of the ground. Although these offerings must have had spiritual significance, they did not have any magic values in themselves. They were always merely symbols, images, pointing to the God who provided the sinner not only sustenance, but also redemption. And so to finish the day, read Micah 6, 7 and Isaiah 1, 11. How can we take the principle applied in these texts and apply it to our lives and worship? Micah 6 verse 1, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil, 
Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And Isaiah 1 verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Tuesday, April 12, The Crime Read Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through to 8. What is the process that led Cain to kill his brother? Also, read 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Genesis 4, beginning at verse 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and the murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brothers righteous. Cain's reaction is twofold. Verse 5 says, Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Cain's anger was directed, it appears, at both God and at Abel. Cain was angry with God because he thought that he was the victim of an injustice and angry with Abel because he was jealous of his brother. Jealous of what? Just the offering? Certainly, more was going on behind the scenes than what is revealed in these few texts. Whatever the issues, Cain was depressed because his offering had not been accepted. God's two questions in Genesis 4 verse 6 are related to Cain's two conditions. Note that God does not accuse Cain. As with Adam, God asks questions not because he doesn't know the answers, but because he wants Cain to look at himself and then understand the reason for his own condition. As always, the Lord seeks to redeem his fallen people, even when they openly fail him. Then, after asking these questions, God counsels Cain. First, God urges Cain to do well, to behave the right way. It is a call for repentance and a change of attitude. God promises Cain that he will be accepted and forgiven. In a sense, he is saying that Cain can have acceptance with God, but it must be done on God's terms, not Cain's. On the other hand, verse 7 reads, If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. God's counsel has revealed the root of sin, and it is found in Cain himself. Here again, God is counselling Cain, seeking to guide him in the way he should go. God's second word of counsel concerns the attitude to take toward this sin which lies at the door, and whose desire is for you. God recommends self-control. You shall rule over it. The same principle resonates in James when he explains in James 1.14 that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The gospel offers us the promise not only of the forgiveness of sin, but also victory over it, as we read in 
1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In the end, Cain had no one to blame for his sin but himself. Isn't it generally that way with all of us as well? And to finish the day, what does this unfortunate story teach us about free will and how God will not force us to obey? Wednesday, April 13, The Punishment of Cain. Read Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 to 16. Why does God ask the question, Where is Abel your brother? What is the connection between Cain's sin and him becoming a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, as it says in Genesis 4, verse 12? Genesis 4, beginning at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. God's question to Cain echoes his question to Adam and Eve. Where are you? This echo suggests the link between the sin in Eden and this sin now. The latter sin, Cain's, was the result of the former one, Adam's. Cain, though, will not acknowledge his sin. He denies it something that Adam didn't do, even though he tried to put the blame elsewhere. Cain, in contrast, openly defies God, who doesn't waste any time confronting Cain with his crime. When God asks the third question, what have you done? He does not even wait for an answer. He reminds Cain that he knows everything, for the voice of Abel's blood has reached him from the ground, as we read in verse 10, an image that signifies that God knows about the murder and will respond to it. Abel is in the ground, a direct link back to the fall and to what the Lord has said would happen to Adam in Genesis 3.19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Read Genesis chapter 4, verse 14. What is the significance of Cain's words that I shall be hidden from your face? Genesis 4, verse 14. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. It is because Abel's blood was poured on the ground, that the ground is now cursed, again, as in Genesis 4 verse 12. As a result, Cain is then condemned to become a refugee, far from God. Only when Cain hears God's sentence does he acknowledge the significance of God's presence, for without it he fears for his own life. 
Even after Cain's cold-blooded murder of his brother and his defiance in the face of it, the Lord still shows mercy to him. And even though Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, as it said in verse 16, the Lord still provided him with some kind of protection. Exactly what that mark was in Genesis 4.15 we haven't been told. But whatever it was, it came only because of God's grace to him. And so to finish today, Genesis 4.14 mentions hidden from your face. What is hidden from the face of God? What a tragic situation for anyone. What is the only way that we as sinners can avoid that situation? Thursday, April 14, The Wickedness of Man Read Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. What was Cain's legacy and how did Cain's crime open the way for the increasing wickedness of mankind? Genesis 4, beginning at verse 17, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methusel, and Methusel begat Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Cain's great-great-great-grandson, Lamech, refers to Cain's crime in the context of his own. This comparison between the crime of Cain and the crime of Lamech is instructive. While Cain keeps silent about his only recorded crime, Lamech seems to be boasting about his, expressing it in a song in verses 23 and 24. While Cain asks for God's mercy, Lamech is not recorded as asking for it. While Cain is avenged seven times by God, Lamech believes that he will be avenged seventy-seven times, as it's said there in verse 24. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. A hint that he is very much aware of his guilt. Also, Cain is monogamous, as we see in verse 17. Lamech introduces polygamy, for the scripture says specifically that he took for himself two wives in verse 19. This intensification and exaltation of evil will definitely affect the next generation of Cainites. Following immediately this episode of evil in the Cainite family, the biblical text records a new event that counters the Cainite trend. Adam knew his wife, Genesis 4.25, and that reads, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And the result is the birth of Seth whose name is given by Eve to indicate that God had put another seed in the place of Abel. In fact, the history of the name Seth precedes Abel. The name Seth is derived from the Hebrew verb ashit, A-S-H-I-T, meaning I will put, as in Genesis 3.15, You'll remember that, where it reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Which introduces the messianic prophecy. 
The Messianic seed will be passed on in the Sethite line. The biblical text gives then the record of the Messianic line beginning with Seth, chapter 5, verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth, and included Enoch in Genesis 5 and verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah, and Methuselah, and ending with Noah in Genesis 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The phrase sons of God used in Genesis 6 verse 2 refers to the line of Seth because they are designed to preserve the image of God. Genesis 6 verse 2 reads that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And that refers us back to Genesis 5 verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam in in the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. In verse 4, after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. On the other hand, the daughters of men, in verse 2 of chapter 6, seems to have a negative connotation, contrasting the offspring of those in the image of God with those in the image of men. And it is under the influence of these daughters of men that the sons of God took wives for themselves of all whom they chose, as it read in Genesis 6 verse 2, indicating the wrong direction humanity was heading. And so, to finish the day, read Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. What a powerful testimony to the corruption of sin! Why must we do all that we can through God's power to eradicate sin from our lives? Genesis 6, verses 1 to 5. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man for ever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also for afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Friday, April 15. The repeated phrase, Enoch walked with God, in Genesis 5, 22 and 24, means intimate and daily companionship with God. Enoch's personal relationship with God was so special that God took him, it says in Genesis 5, 24. This last phrase is, however, unique in the genealogy of Adam and does not support the idea of an immediate afterlife in paradise for those who walk with God. Note that Noah also walked with God in Genesis 6 verse 9, and he died like all the other humans, including Adam and Methuselah. It also is interesting to note that no reason is given to justify this special grace. As we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 86, Enoch became a preacher of righteousness, making known to the people what God had revealed to him. Those who feared the Lord sought out this holy man to share his instruction and his prayers. He laboured publicly also, bearing God's messages to all who would hear the words of warning. His labours were not restricted to the Sethites. In the land where Cain had sought to flee from the divine presence, the prophet of God made known the wonderful scenes that had passed 
passed before his vision. Behold, he declared, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. Jude 14 and 15. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, why did Cain kill his brother? Read the following comment by Eli Wessel. Why did he do it? Perhaps he wanted to remain alone, an only child, and after his parents' death, the only man? Alone, like God, and perhaps alone in place of God? Cain killed to become God. Any man who takes himself for God ends up assassinating men. And that's from Messengers of God, Biblical Portraits and Legends, published in 1976 and page 58. How can we be careful, even if we don't commit murder, not to reflect the attitude of Cain? And question two. Compare the lifespan of the antediluvians in Genesis 5 to that of the patriarchs. How would we explain this decreasing of the span of human life? How does this degeneration counter the premises of modern Darwinism? Well, let's have a look at Genesis chapter 5. In verse 5 we read, So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And then verse 8, So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And verse 11, So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And verse 14, So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And verse 17, so all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And verse 20, so all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And verse 23, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And verse 27, so all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And verse 31, so all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And verse 32, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Inside Story Forgiven in Prison Part 2 by Andrew McChesney The next Sabbath, inmate Matthias greeted Dante, a 36-year-old theology student from Segunto Adventist College, with a flurry of happy conversation at the prison in Spain. After several minutes, however, Matthias abruptly changed his tone and began to fidget nervously. He spoke about his childhood and adult life. He described years-long struggle over sinful desires. I don't feel like I've done anything wrong, he said. When I leave prison, I'll repeat what I did. He stared at Dante, waiting to see his reaction. Dante understood that he was being tested. Matthias wanted to see whether he would reflect a condemning or a loving God. Dante prayed silently, Jesus, give me your grace. You forgave me and you can forgive him. Matthias, seeing that his visitor sat calmly, spoke again. What would you do to me if you caught me, he asked. Dante, still praying, answered slowly, If God can give me grace and salvation, he can give you grace and salvation too. Shock twisted Matthias's face. Aren't you going to condemn me, he asked. Opening the Bible, Dante read, For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, Romans seven nineteen and 20. We often don't understand our actions, he said. We don't do what we want to do, and we end up doing what we don't want to do. Could it be 
that you don't feel bad about your actions because you can't control them. Matthias grabbed the Bible from Dante's hand and read the passage. Dante turned to Romans 8 verses 1 and 2 and read, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. God hasn't condemned you, Dante said. He wants to help you and he loves you all the time. You can live differently. You just have to let the Spirit of God dwell in you. He wants to help you just like he helped me. Deep sorrow filled Matthias's face. The scorn and contempt were gone. Dante understood that. For the first time, Matthias was experiencing a deep sense of guilt. Everything changed from that day. Matthias stopped mocking God and the Bible. From that moment, I started to study the Bible with him, Dante said in an interview. From that moment, he wanted to change his life. He no longer wanted to continue in his old ways, but to be on God's side. Matthias, not his real name, is among more than a dozen prisoners receiving Bible studies every Sabbath afternoon from Dante and nine other students from Segunto Adventist College. Your Sabbath School mission offerings help Adventist educational institutions worldwide train students like Dante to share Jesus' precious promise of grace and salvation to a sin-sick world. If God can change my heart, God can change anybody's heart, Dante said. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.